Okay, so oddly enough, uh, the last little section that we talked about um, in the beginning video of chapter 11 was dealing with um, whether or not molecules were polar. Um, and so we got to the end of that conversation and then I did have a practice problem for you guys to do, but we didn't ever get to that practice problem. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start out the remainder of chapter 11 today in dealing with that practice problem. Um, and then we'll move on to the, the next topic overall. All right, so the questions that we're asking at this point in time are whether or not molecules are polar or nonpolar. Or another way to answer this or ask the same question is whether or not molecules have a, a net dipole moment. All right, so if they have a net dipole moment, then that means that they are polar. If they do not have a net dipole moment, then they are nonpolar. Okay. All right, then to answer this question, we need to satisfy one of two things, right? So if a molecule is going to be polar, number one, we have to have polar bonds, right? And so we utilize uh, those differences in electronegativity. So we utilize electronegativity. Let's go ahead and just do differences. So differences in electronegativity to determine whether or not um, we do actually possess polar bonds. Um, and then the second criteria for determining whether or not a molecule is going to be polar is if um, those dipole moments or those uh, dipole moments from each individual bond, if they have like a net vector addition to something other than zero, right? So what we're really asking here is are these bonds, are they symmetric, right? Is the molecule symmetric in three-dimensional shape or is it unsymmetric, right? And so the way we say that, and it's like a confusing way to say it, but is there um, a net vector addition of those individual dipoles? So net vector addition that is not equal to zero. Okay, and hopefully I'll illustrate what I mean by that. And I hopefully I illustrated it when we talked about water, etc. cetera. Um, so first question we're asking, or first molecule we're gonna deal with is ammonia. Um, so to go ahead and answer these questions, first thing I have to do is draw the Lewis structure. So if I start with number one, we've got ammonia. Again, my first step in drawing the Lewis structure is drawing the skeletal structure. So we've got nitrogen. It's gonna be surrounded by the three hydrogens. Um, so then we'll sum up the valence electrons. We get five from nitrogen plus three times one, which gives us eight valence electrons overall. We'll start with single bonds between the central atom and all of the terminal atoms. And so that's two, four, six electrons. We still have two more to get rid of, so that's just going to go as a lone pair on nitrogen. Okay, so that's number one. Draw the Lewis structure. Now, the Lewis structure is going to tell us the overall um, molecular geometry of the molecule, right? So if we counted right now, we need to count to determine molecular geometry, we need to count electron domains. And again, an electron domain is either going to be a lone pair of electrons, that will count as one, or any type of bond will count as one as well. So if it's a double bond, it'll count as one electron domain. If it's a single bond, it'll count as one electron domain. So as we count around nitrogen, which is a single atom, we've got one, two, three, four electron domains or four electron groups. Again, those words are kind of synonymous. So four electron groups. So there are four electron domains. These all mean the same thing. Another way to say this, depending on the textbook that you're using, they will also call this, um, sorry, a steric number equal to four. All right, so steric number, electron groups, electron domains are all the same. It's all gonna be four for ammonia here, the nitrogen and ammonia. But now we have to specify how many of these are bonding versus non-bonding, right? So we have four total groups, and I don't wanna rewrite them. Three of these guys are bonding, and then one is a non-bonding electron group, right? And so if we go back to our little molecular geometry chart, uh, we look at four electron Domain geometry is tetrahedral, right? So this tells us that the base structure is tetrahedral. But again, electron geometry, this is electron geometry, um, is different than molecular geometry. Molecular geometry is defined by the number, the base electron geometry, so it's defined by it being tetrahedral, but then it's also defined by how many non-bonding and bonding groups there are. For three bonding, one non-bonding, we get an overall molecular geometry that is trigonal, pyramidal. All 
And so if we drew that, we would have like a nitrogen. We'll let the lone pair be in the plane of the board. Um, we'll have, let's say, one bond coming out at us, one bond going in. We have an I a hydrogen, a hydrogen, and then we've got this guy, another hydrogen. So again, I'm trying to, you know, in two dimensions, trying to represent this tetrahedral structure. Um, again, we know the bond angles here. The bond angles are 107 degrees. And we only see the bonds, the nitrogen to hydrogen, we don't see the lone pair of electrons, right? But again, that lone pair of electrons serves to kind of push these bonds or decrease these bonds. That's why we see that decreased bond angle comparatively to the 109.5, which is what we would normally see for a pure, perfect tetrahedron. Okay, so that's important. We need Lewis structure to get at the molecular geometry. Once we have the molecular geometry, now we can you know, kind of answer this question, what is the net vector addition if we do have polar bonds of these dipole moments of these bonds? So now we can go ahead and ask our question. Number one, are these bonds polar? So we're looking at nitrogen-hydrogen bonds. There is a very large difference in electronegativity between these two. Um, so I think if you calculate it, this ends up being about a 0.9 difference in electronegativity. Again, with respect to these values for electronegativities, you don't necessarily have to memorize them. Um, but just getting kind of an idea of the types of bonds that tend to be polar um, would be important. So nitrogen, hydrogen, these guys are polar bonds. Um, and so then if we drew that like dipole, nitrogen is the more electronegative of the two. It's farther to the right on the periodic table. So it's going to pull those electrons towards itself. This is towards itself again and then towards itself again, right? And again, I'm trying to depict this three-dimensional shape. These bonds are kind of like like plotted below um, the nitrogen, right? It's not like perfectly uh, planar. They're kind of like propped up almost, if that makes sense. It's hard to, it's hard to depict this in two-dimensional space. Um, but when we add all of these guys together, so maybe I should have uh, made these red to make them a little bit clearer. When we add all of these guys together, they will cancel each other in our x direction, but what we'll end up with is a net vector overall in the y direction, right? Something pulling up directly. Um, and so because of that, this is what we would define as a net vector addition. Let me get back to pen. We have net vector addition that is not equal to zero. We do get a net vector overall. This thing does have a net dipole. So because of that, bonds are polar, check, we got that. It does have a net dipole, check, we got that. So because of that, this is a polar molecule. Both of those criteria have to be met for this thing to be polar. If they had had polar bonds, but that net vector addition actually ended up being zero, then it would have been nonpolar overall, which is very similar to what we see for um, something like CO2. Okay, so go ahead and try uh, the last three of these. Come back for the answer. Um, again, I would just stress that these bonds and the overall molecular geometry needs to be symmetric for you to not have, or for you to have a net vector addition equal to zero, right? So... It's a perfectly symmetric molecule. Um, everything's going to cancel out. You'll have a net vector addition equal to zero. You'll have a nonpolar molecule. If it's not perfectly uh, symmetric, you will tend to have um, polarity in that molecule. So go ahead and try these and then come back for the answer. Okay, so we'll go ahead and go over uh, number two first, so I'm going to move out here. We've got two where we've got this uh, sulfur tetrachloride, so CSCl4. Again, if I add up all of my valence electrons here, I've got six plus four times seven. Four times seven is 28, plus six is 34 electrons. So we go ahead and draw sulfur as our central atom. Let's surround it with four chlorines. We'll draw a single bond, single bond, single bond, single bond. So that's two, four, six, eight. We'll fill in these outer octets. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
Oh, is it? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 32. Okay. So 32 is what we distributed. But we had 34 to get rid of. So that extra two electrons goes as a lone pair on the central atom. Okay. So now we'll count electron groups. Again, an electron group or an electron domain or a steric number is a lone pair or any type of bond. We've got one for the lone pair. We've got two for the single, three, four, five. So we have five electron groups. That's the four. Five electron groups. So because of that, our electron group geometry is um, trigonal bipyramidal. Going right in black. So this is trigonal bipyramidal. I think I'm spelling pyramidal wrong, but you know, whatever, it happens. Um, now, that's the basis of what the actual molecular geometry is, and this would be a trigonal bipyramidal structure if all four or all five of those electron groups were bonding groups. Instead, though, we do have one lone pair, so we have four bonding, we have one non-bonding, and so overall, because of that, our molecular geometry is not trigonal bipyramidal, it is instead, what is the four bonding one non? It's the seesaw. Yeah, seesaw. So if we, let's think, if we tried to draw that, we would want to leave probably the lone pair. Let's go ahead. So I'm going to go ahead and yeah, so we'll do sulfur with a chlorine, with a chlorine. Those guys will be in the plane of the board, as will this lone pair. And then we'll have a chlorine coming out at us. And then a chlorine going in. All right, so this is a really bad depiction of this seesaw shape. But again, um, if you can imagine what a seesaw looks like. I'm trying to imagine what a seesaw looks like. I'm having issues. These guys would be the thing, like this is where, you know, a person would stand. This is where a person would stand and it'd be moving like a seesaw, right? But it's not really moving. I'm just trying to get you uh, an actual mental depiction of what this would look like. Okay, so because of that, we could already kind of, well, it depends. So um, next thing we have to do is look at whether or not these bonds are polar. So chlorine and sulfur line the same uh, row of the periodic table, um, but if you actually look at the values that they give you, chlorine has an electronegativity of 3, whereas sulfur has an electronegativity of 2.5. So that difference is, or it does match our criteria of a polar bond. So these bonds are polar, so number one, polar bonds, we do get a check, so that's a yes. Now, if we think about who's more electronegative, we have chlorine that's more electronegative. So I'm going to change colors here. Um, chlorine is pulling those electrons towards itself. This guy's pulling those electrons towards itself. Those two would essentially cancel, right? The, those two bonds that lie in the same plane. If we added up those two vectors, it would be zero. But because we also have these two, so we've got this guy pulling down. We've got this guy pulling down. When you add up uh, these two guys, right? Um, they're not gonna cancel each other because again, they're like pulling down below the plane of that sulfur chlorine, these two bonds up here. Um, and so overall in their net vector, we would have something uh, pulling down. It's not matched by anything up here pulling. So this would be a net vector. So we do get a net dipole. And so because of that, this is a polar molecule. Okay, so carbon, uh, difluoride, dichloride, so number three, we got carbon, F2, Cl2, same thing, carbon gives us four, plus two times seven, plus two times seven, so that's 14, 14, 28, plus four is 32. Put carbon in the middle, carbon, chlorine, chlorine, fluorine, fluorine, we've got single bonds, when I go in and fill in all the outer octets, everyone is happy and that is 32 electrons. So now we determine electron domains. We've got um, 
four electron groups or electron domains. Um, that's going to give us overall for an electron geometry of a tetrahedral. And then all of these all are bonding. So because of that, this is a perfect tetrahedron, or it is a tetrahedral structure. So molecular geometry um, is also tetrahedral. And if you're like, hey, where are you getting that from? Again, just go back to the molecular geometry chart. This is where all of these structures are coming from. Okay, so if this is a perfect tetrahedron, um, then what we have is we'll say chlorine or fluorine up here. We'll have this fluorine lie in the same plane. So anytime I draw a solid bond or solid line, that means that those bonds are in the same uh, plane of the board. And then we'll have one of these guys coming out and then one of them going in. Okay, so now, Tetrahedral, as a structure, is very symmetric, and it would be perfectly symmetric, and these guys would not be polar, or this, this molecule would not be polar if all of these bonds were equal, but not all of these bonds are equal, right? So number one question is, are they polar? The answer to that, so bonds, polar, the answer to that is yes, right? Carbon fluorine, there's a very large difference in electronegativity there. It ends up being like 1.5. Carbon chlorine ends up being like 0.5, right? So these bonds are polar. But now if we draw like the magnitude of their dipole, this carbon fluorine would be super big because it's a very polar bond. This carbon fluorine would also be super big, oops, because it's a very polar bond. But these chlorine carbons, they're still polar, but they're not as polar. Right, so they would have a, a smaller magnitude overall, so that when you did add these all together, those carbon chlorine bonds wouldn't essentially match the carbon fluorines, right? So you would get like a net vector um, pulling out over here. So because these bonds aren't equal, right, they're not all the same bond, that's why we would still have a polar molecule here because we still do, still do get a net vector net vector, and we do get a polar molecule. Okay, well this is taking me 20 minutes to go over this, so last one we have the selenium uh, hexafluoride. So it's this guy up here. So four, we've got selenium uh, hexafluoride. So selenium is right below sulfur which is right below oxygen, which has six, plus six times seven, six times seven is 42, plus six is 48. So we've got selenium right in the middle. We put a fluorine, 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 we put a fluorine. We have six of them, make sure. We've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. And then if we fill in, everything for the outer atom octets we've got six times eight which gives us 48 so that is good that is done that is the structure okay so now if we count electron groups we've got one two three four five six bonds there are no lone pairs so overall for electron groups we've got six so then electron group geometry, if you look on the chart, six electron groups, it's where we enter the chart that gives us an octahedral structure. And so if we tried to draw that, like um, again, this three dimensional type sh situation, uh, what would happen here is that these guys would be in the plane, these guys would be in the plane, but then these bonds would be coming out at us Right, and then these guys would be going into the board. Um, so, okay, so octahedral, all of these, so if that's the electron geometry, all of these, so six are bonding. There are zero non-bonding. So that means that the overall molecular geometry is also octahedral. Now the question is, are these bonds polar? The answer to that is yes. So polar bonds, 
Yes, if you look at selenium, selenium's like a 2.4. Fluorine's, again, the most electro, most electronegative element in the periodic table. Um, so any bond with fluorine is usually going to be polar. I don't think there's an exception to that. Pretty much anyone bound with fluorine is polar. Um, now the question is, well, is there a net vector addition? And so this is one of the situations where an octahedral structure is perfectly symmetric, right? If you have all of these bonds and they all are polar, right, all these guys are going to be pooling in the direction of those bonds. So we get this guy, we have this guy pulling down, and then this guy's coming out at us. If you add all of those together, they cancel, right? So the net vector here would be equal to zero. Everything cancels out. And so we, because we get a net vector equal to zero, overall, this is a nonpolar molecule. This is one of those situations where even though we have polar bonds, because that is a symmetric, perfectly symmetric molecule and all those bonds pull equally in opposite directions, um, all of those net, all those vectors or all those dipoles are going to cancel and we're going to be left with a nonpolar molecule overall. No net vector, no net dipole. Okay. All right. So that was a lot of work, right? Um, again, though, as you get comfortable with the Lewis structure part, as you get comfortable with the molecular geometry part, um, it becomes a lot easier to discern, right? Um, so I would really be comfortable with that. You will have any, I always give you guys the, no, I'm not going to say that just in case. So I'm not going to mention. All right, moving on. Okay, so now um, we're going to get into kind of the more complex theories of bonding um, with the remainder of this chapter. We're going to spend a lot of time with valence bond theory, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about molecular orbital theory at the end. Um, but again, what we're doing with respect to these bonding theories is we're kind of building on complexity and how we explain bonding. Um, but at the same time, we're going to kind of use a lot of, not necessarily the usefulness, um, but the ability to quantitatively do this, right? So um, with valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory, we're going to give you kind of like a qualitative, not hand wavy kind of understanding of what's happened, what's happening, but just be aware of the fact that there is a quantitative side to this. It's just beyond the scope and the, beyond the complexity of this course, okay? Okay, so with valence bond theory, what's the difference, right? Thus far, we've been talking about Lewis theory, right? And so in Lewis theory, let's say that we had a hydrogen molecule, right? And we were forming our Lewis structure for H2. Um, when we draw our electrons in Lewis theory, or these Lewis um, dot structures, we draw them either as, let's say, um, dots, right, with respect to lone pairs or just electrons, or we draw them as lines in the form of bonds, right? So now, so this is obviously, you know, is kind of an oversimplification in the fact that we spent a lot of time in the chapter dealing with quantum mechanics talking about how we can't treat electrons as dots or as particles, right? Instead, we have to treat them as waves, right? And so our explanation of the electron and how we were going to treat it in terms of waves came out in the form of like the derivation of all of those atomic orbitals, right? So hydrogen, if we just think about plain old hydrogen by itself, we know that it has one electron, right? And we know that that one electron goes in the 1s orbital, right? And so the way that we depict that 1s orbital is as a sphere, right? And that's it. Remember, this is a surface diagram. It's predicting 90% of the probability of finding that one electron in this given region of space about the nucleus, but this is how we are gonna to have to treat the electron moving forward, okay? So that's what valence bond theory attempts to do, right? It attempts to start, try to start explaining bonding in terms of treating the electrons as these orbitals instead of treating them as these dots. And so that's kind of the basis. We're gonna to start to look at bonding in terms of quantum mechanics as opposed to just treating as, them as dots or treating them as lines, drawing these simplistic structures. Okay, so now let's consider hydrogen a little bit closer, right? In terms of trying again to now explain bonding that we see in terms of these atomic orbitals comparatively to just, you know, trying to obtain a duet or an octet of electrons, okay? So for H2, again, when we draw the Lewis structure, it's just two hydrogen 
um, can bind or connected via a single bond between them. Um, if we think of each hydrogen by itself, so each atom of hydrogen, we know, okay, we've got one electron, it's in that 1s orbital, right? So let's say we have one hydrogen atom, and we're going to depict the electrons very similar to what we would in an orbital diagram, right? If we drew an orbital diagram, um, we would depict that one electron as that half arrow pointing up. So we'll bring this guy, got a little half arrow pointing up. So this is one hydrogen atom. And so the other hydrogen atom is the exact same. We've got another 1s orbital. Right? 1s orbital is spherically symmetric. And we'll have another um, atom or another electron in that 1s orbital. Okay. Now, in terms of valence bond theory, what we're going to imagine, we have these two atoms by themselves out in space, right? And we're going to imagine what happens to the potential energy of the two as we begin to bring these guys closer together. So as we decrease this distance between the two, okay? So with the orbital, right, with the electron that is, that is essentially being represented by that orbital, um, we also have another bit and piece that's kind of important in terms of of all of the various attractions and repulsions that we're going to find as we bring these guys together and that is represented by the nucleus right so we know that for example this electron in hydrogen is attracted to its own nucleus right electrons are negatively charged protons are positively charged there's an attractive force between the two just as this electron is attracted to its nucleus okay now as we bring these guys closer together as we decrease this distance right there's not only going to be the attraction between an atom's electron and its nucleus, but now we're also going to start to develop an attraction between this atom's electron and this nucleus, right? As we bring these guys closer together, right? Same thing for this electron. It's also going to be attracted to this nucleus, right? So as we bring these guys closer together, this attraction is going to decrease potential energy, right? So we bring them closer together, closer together. We're going to get this overall net decrease in potential energy because of this attractive forces between the electrons and the nuclei of each individual atom, right? Until we reach a point where they start to get too close, right? And so, again, we had a decrease in potential energy overall, but as we continue to decrease this distance, as we continue to bring these guys closer together, now we're gonna start to see an increase in potential energy. So we shift and start to increase potential energy, and that's gonna be due to the repulsive forces now between the electron and the electron, as well as the nucleus and the nucleus, right? As we bring those two nuclei close together, we're really gonna to start to feel a repulsive force, which is gonna increase potential energy overall, all right? So this guy right here, this, tends up, this ends up being the bond distance between um, the two atoms of hydrogen in the H2 molecule, right? It's kind of like this perfect, um, happy like medium or happy in between um, where you have these electrons that are in each of these two atoms they can spend time and are happy interacting with the elect with the nuclei of the other atom um, but that's again going to come before we start to get that real bad nuclear and electron electron repulsion that's going to increase potential energy okay okay so this is the basic idea right why do bombs form well, we already said, or we I think we've said, um, bonds form when we can lower potential energy of the two individual atoms, right? So if we had looked at just hydrogen by itself, they had a potential energy of here. By bringing those two atoms together and letting those two electrons interact with the other nuclei, etc., we lowered potential energy to our essential bond energy between the two atoms, okay? So why is it form? Because we lower potential energy. Now, the question is, overall, because that's kind of, you know, bringing these guys together and drawing these potential energy charts is not necessarily going to be something that we can do. Um, so the question is, well, qualitatively, how do we know whether or not um, bringing two atoms together is going to lower their potential energy? And the answer to that kind of comes in the form of valence bond theory, right? So what valence bond theory states is that we are going to lower the potential energy of two atoms, right? And they're going to form a bond because of that. When you have orbitals, these atomic orbitals, um, with unpaired electrons, as you bring those two atomic orbitals together with those unpaired electrons, they're allowed to overlap in a constructive manner, and they're also allowed to pair their spin, right? So we have talked already, again, if we draw these 
let's say orbital diagrams, right? We've depicted these orbitals as these boxes or whatever, but we talked specifically about how electrons like to spin pair, right? Um, there's a particular energetic favorability when you have an unpaired electron um, be allowed to pair its spin, right? And again, two electrons go into each individual orbital. We're gonna find the exact same thing here. If you have an atom with an unpaired electron and you have another atom, with an unpaired electron in an orbital, and you bring those two orbitals together, and it allows them to essentially pair their spin, right? That's usually what's gonna lead to a bond, okay? And that's the big takeaway with respect to bond, valence bond theory for us right now. Now, um, let's try to utilize this to explain bonding in something that's a little bit more complex than just hydrogen. Right, so let's try to explain bonding in something like H2S. You know, using this idea behind valence bond theory that we have these electrons and these atomic orbitals, they're coming together, they're overlapping, they're spin pairing, and that's why we're getting bonds, okay? Now, if we think about H2S, we know that we have sulfur. Sulfur is going to be our central atom here, right? And it's going to be making bonds with these two hydrogens out here, right? Now, again, the term valence bond theory should kind of hint at you what type of electrons are actually going to be participating in this orbital overlap, right? So when anytime we're dealing with any of this bonding, it's always going to be valence electrons that we're dealing with. Um, and so the valence electrons for hydrogen, or at least the atomic orbitals that those valence electrons are represented by, um, is again that 1s orbital, right? So we've talked about that guy. Same thing for this hydrogen, we have the 1s orbital. But now if we think about the valence bond or the valence electrons, pardon me, um, for sulfur, we know that sulfur is in the third row of the periodic table. So the valence electrons for sulfur are 3s2 and then 3p4. Okay, so now if we drew the orbital diagrams for each of those, we've got a hydrogen with its 1s electrons. We're actually going to draw the orbitals too to represent these um, in a second. We have hydrogen with its 1s electron. And then for sulfur, we know that when we put these valence electrons in, we're going to fill the s first because it's a little lower energy. And then we're going to go in and fill the p's. So it's singly first. And then we come back and pair spin. Right? So again, this is the valence electrons with sulfur. This is 3s2, uh, 3p4. Now, we like to draw it in these orbital diagrams because it helps us see um, how many potential bonds can actually be formed from these orbital overlaps, right? So again, to form a bond in valence bond theory, you have to have an unpaired electron, right? You can't have a filled orbital because that doesn't have an unpaired electron. And right now you can't have an empty orbital because that doesn't have an unpaired electron, okay? So we're looking at this for sulfur, the only num the number of bonds that we're actually only gonna be able to form are for this orbital and this orbital, right? That though both of those have unpaired electrons, that can um, overlap with our unpaired electrons of these two hydrogen and pair spin, which again is gonna lead to that lowering of potential energy and the formation of a bond, okay? So if we think about what that would look like in terms of atomic orbitals, um, I'm gonna go ahead and draw what these 3p orbitals would look like, right? So remember there are three 3p orbitals, all they differ in is their uh, three-dimensionality in space or their orientation in space. One of them points along the x-axis, one of them points along the y-axis, one of them points along the z-axis. So if we drew that, all right, so we drew Cartesian coordinates, right, x, y, and z, these p orbitals look like dumbbells, so we can go ahead and, and draw that as well. So I'm going to change my, um, we have z, let's say we have x, and we have y. So if we have one of them pointing along the z-axis, we can draw that as a dumbbell. And again, we'll go ahead and shade to indicate phase here. We have one of them lying along the x-axis, right? And so we can go ahead and shade. And then we have one of them lying along the y-axis, right? Y-axis, and we can go ahead and shade, okay? So again, we'll say for the x-axis, p orbital, we already had filled right? So this was our x-axis. Now we're going to go ahead and put in our single electrons into the z and into the y. All right, so now these z, these p, z, and p, y, they're ready now to form bonds 
with these nice 1s orbitals coming from hydrogen. So we have our 1s orbitals coming from hydrogen. It's spherically symmetric, right? We know that it also has an electron that can spin pair. So we can go ahead and put that one in um, pointing down because the first one was pointing up. So this is our hydrogen. We can do the same thing up here, right? We've got spin up, we can put it spin down. This is our other hydrogen. And again, if we imagine that that's what H2S looks like and that's what the bonding is coming from, right? Where we have these P orbitals that have unpaired electrons on the sulfur, they're overlapping with the 1s orbitals of each hydrogen. We have spin pairing, we have energetically favorable interaction, so we have lowering potential energy, then this is what the molecule H2S would look like, right? So we think about what like that bond, which is what we're forming here, would look like, or at least the bond angles between these two, and just think back to well, what is the bond angle between the Z axis and the Y axis, or between the X axis and the Y axis, we would find that that bond angle is about 90 degrees, right? Because again, that's essentially just the distance or the angle between the Z and the Y axis, which is where these bonds are lying along. Okay, so we are predicting using valence bond theory that this is how bonding happens in H2S, and these bond angles coming from just the atomic orbitals are going to be about 90 degrees. And what we actually find is the real bond angle is very, very, very close to what we predict using this theory. It ends up being about 92 degrees instead of 90, right? So because of that, we know that H2S forms. We know that only two bonds between sulfur and hydrogen form. And we know that that bond angle between the two is about 90 degrees. So this idea behind having these atomic orbitals overlap and pair their spins, it makes a lot of sense in terms of bonding in H2S. Okay, now what if we move on to something a little bit more complicated that doesn't necessarily make sense without a little bit of uh, re-explanation beforehand, right? So let's try to explain bonding in terms of methane using this exact same idea, right? Where we're going to form bonds when atomic orbitals are allowed to overlap, constructively impair their spins. Okay, so we're going to try to explain bonding in methane. We know that the chemical formula for methane is CH4. And we can draw out the Lewis structure for methane um, as carbon with four bonds to hydrogen. Now, if we think in terms, again, going back to these atomic orbitals um, and the atomic orbitals of the valence electrons for everyone involved, we know that, again, the valence electrons for each hydrogen, we only have one electron, it's in the 1s orbital. And then the valence electrons for carbon are the 2s2, 2p2, right? And if we put them into each individual orbital, we would again put them into the s orbital first. We would spin pair, and then we would put them individually with parallel spins into the p orbitals. Okay, so now, again, going back to this idea behind bonding coming about via the uh, orbital overlap for unpaired electrons, if we look at carbon and we need an unpaired electron to make a bond, right, then we should see that, well, we can really only make bonds with two of these. We can't make bonds with a filled orbital and we can't make bonds with an empty orbital, right? So with that, we're kind of stuck. Well, we should only really see two bonds form and no other, right? But we know that four bonds form, so that's an issue, okay? So now, if I draw out the energy diagram for these orbitals, right? So we know that the 2s is at a little bit lower of an energy than the 3, 2p. And we put those electrons in there. We know that this energy difference, this difference in energy is kind of small between the two. So to try to explain the four bonds that we see in methane as opposed to just the two, we could say, all right, well, what if we add in a little energy, right? So what if we add in a little energy in the form of something like heat or in the form of something like light, right? If we added in enough energy that essentially equals the energy distance between um, the 2s and the 2p, then essentially what we could do is promote one of these electrons from the 2s into the 2p. So we had the 2s here, and then we had the 2p, and we put in a little tiny bit of energy, one of those electrons, or let's say this guy, would be promoted from the 2s to the 2p, right? And so now, if we look at this, 
If we just put or take that one electron, put it into the 2p with a little bit of excess energy, now we have four orbitals that are um, half filled, right? We have four orbitals with single electrons in each one that are now ready to spin pair and form four bonds. So this would explain the four bonds that we actually see in methane, okay? Now, again, using the same rationale that we did for H2S, if we drew those valence electrons, Right again, we're imagining that we've done this. We've promoted that electron to an, um, to the two p orbital. So now we have four orbitals that are ready to spin pair. Um, if we go ahead and draw out what those orbitals look like, right? So we have our z, we have our x, we have our y. We've got one here, so we'll shade. We've got one here, we'll shade. We've got one here, we'll shade. And then we also have that two s which is again spherically symmetric in here. I'm gonna go ahead and put in the single electrons. So a single electron, that's an ugly electron. We have a single electron, we have a single electron, and then we'll have a single electron in here. So this is carbon, right? This would be the, the kind of the orbitals for carbon. Now we're gonna have our hydrogens come along, right? So hydrogen are just spherically symmetric. Spherically symmetric, spherically symmetric. These are the bonds that are forming between this orbital overlap. And then I guess we'll have one come in here somehow. I don't know how, but it will. Um, and each of these will have an electron in it that will spin pair, spin pair, spin pair. And then this guy comes in and spin pairs. So again, each of these guys is hydrogen. Here's a hydrogen, here's a hydrogen, here's a hydrogen. We have that orbital overlap. They're all um, overlapping along the same axis. We have spin pairing. So this should explain the bonding that we see in methane, right? Now, ideally, you should be like, well, there's a problem here, right? So again, same thing with respect to sulfur um, in H2S. We know that the angle between the X and the Y and the Z axis is, again, only 90 degrees, right? So we would expect to find a bond angle here about 90, a bond angle here of about 90, a bond angle over here, um, kind of a little bit different, but you know, whatever, something like 90, okay? You should also be able to say, oh wait, I know that's not true, right? I know that um, the bond angle in methane is 109.5. We just spent a lot of time talking about how it's a tetrahedral structure and it's got a perfect bond angle of 109.5. So this reality and this um, valence bond theory ideality are not the same, right? And so there's something that we're missing here, okay? And so this is when a, a thing called hybridization comes in, right? So if we were to take our valence orbitals for carbon, all right, our S and our 3,2P, again, we would apply a little bit of energy to promote that electron, right? But instead of just doing that and leaving it as those atomic orbitals, if we were to take all four of those orbitals, again, this guy and these three, and we were to put them in what we're going to call a hybridization blender, right? So we'll say this is our hybridization blender, right? And again, with hybridization, it's taking two things and it's forming like a product between the two or an averaging between the two, right? So we take all four of those and we spit out four orbitals that have properties of both the S and all three of the P's, right? Then we would call these new orbitals SP3 hybrid orbitals, right? Because again, we have one S and we have three P's. So these are three, this is one, that's what's forming the S and then the SP3. And that three is a superscript. So notice that these are all equal energy. So again, anything that has equal energy in terms of orbitals, we call degenerate. And with that, again, we had four orbitals in, we're putting four orbitals out. These are what we're gonna call these sp3 hybrid orbitals. Um, we also had four electrons in those orbitals initially. So now if we put four electrons into our new sp3 hybrid orbitals, we're gonna follow the exact same rule. So it's gonna be um, put them in singly first with parallel spins. If we had more, we'd come back and pair their spin, but we don't, we only had four to begin with. So now we take our atomic orbitals for carbon, we hybridize them, and we end up with four sp3 hybrid orbitals, all at equal energy and all with an electron 
um, a single electron that is now ready to spin pair in terms of bonding. Okay, so now the whole idea behind this hybridization wasn't necessarily explaining um, four single electrons in orbitals, it was mainly explaining the geometry. So now if we imagine taking that circle, right, that S, and taking our 3P and kind of making this average of all three of them combined, um, what we would end up with something that looks like this, right? So again, we're combining all three of these guys, averaging them, and we're ending up with four orbitals um, that essentially when you overlap those four orbitals form our tetrahedron, form our tetrahedral overall shape. So note that the P's have changes of phase, right? So one is shaded, one is not, one is shaded, one is not. The sp3 orbitals also have changes of phase. It's just this um, out of phase side is very, very, very tiny. So usually when we combine all these together to form our overall um, kind of like three dimensional structure, we ignore that out of phase component, right? So they've essentially combined all four of these sp3 orbitals and they've ignored that little out of phase component, that other phase component um, at, the, at the back of that. All right, so now these are our new sp3 hybrid orbitals, right? They each have an unpaired electron that is now ready to spin pair. So we bring in our hydrogens with its 1s, we have orbital overlap, bring in hydrogen with its 1s, we have orbital overlap, bring in hydrogen with its 1s, we have orbital overlap, and then orbital overlap. So now we should be able to explain the overall tetrahedral structure of methane, which is what we find. Okay, so really quickly, I just want to note before we move on that, again, this was our sp3 hybrid orbital from carbon. We had this orbital overlap with our 1s orbital from hydrogen, right? And this was forming our bond between these two orbitals. Again, it's this orbital overlap. That's what's forming our overall bond. Anytime this happens along the same intranuclear axis, and what we mean by that is here's the nucleus of hydrogen, here's the nucleus of carbon. These are all along the same axis, right? This orbital overlap is. That type of bond specifically is called a sigma bond. So a sigma bond forms when you get this orbital overlap, this 1s and this sp3 orbital, and they overlap together along the exact same um, line or the exact same axis. This is called a sigma bond, and it's represented by the Greek letter sigma. This is an ugly sigma, but um, you get the drift. So this is supposed to be sigma. So we also will just say sigma bond. And so then for all of the bonds in methane, we've got the same internuclear axis, internuclear axis, internuclear axis. All of these are sigma bonds. And most importantly, when we compare them back to our um, Lewis structure, how do we depict these bonds in our Lewis structure? We depict it as single bonds, right? So here's where my writing gets real terrible. Let me draw this a little bit prettier. So all sigma bonds, right? And in terms of our Lewis structure, all of those bonds between carbon and hydrogen were single bonds. So all single bonds are sigma bonds. Okay. Okay, so that's kind of just the basic introduction behind hybridization um, in terms of valence bond theory. And again, we've only really gone over, what we're going to find is there's going to be um, other types of hybrid orbitals that are going to form, um, but thus far we've really only talked about the formation of sp3 hybrid orbitals, okay? Um, and so regardless of the type of hybrid orbitals that we talk about, there are going to be a couple of rules that we have to follow um, with respect to these hybrid orbitals and this hybridization. The first one's kind of important in that it's the, um, essentially states that the number of orbitals that you bring in to hybridize have to equal the number of orbitals that you get out long term, right? So for sp3 hybridization, we utilized one s orbital and then we utilized three p orbitals, right? Um, so overall long term, we had four orbitals that we brought in. We had to get four hybrid orbitals out, right? And so that's 
um, the case in terms of sp3 hybridization. There are four separate sp3 hybrid orbitals that come out of there. Um, another big thing is that only central atoms hybridize, right? So for example, in methane, um, we had carbon as our central atom, right? This guy is our central atom, and we talked about the hybrid orbitals that form from the atomic orbitals of carbon. So this is what hybridizes. It's not going to be these terminal atoms, right? So, for example, hydrogen, 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 they just stay their normal atomic orbitals. This just stayed the basic 1s orbital, right? We don't have to talk about hybridization in terms of these terminal atoms. It's only the central atom that will actually hybridize. And then the question is, well, how do we know? Like, I'm, you know, I can explain this and go through it and say, oh, carbon uses sp3 hybridization. It comes from, there's only two electrons and the p orbitals, etc. But the question is, well, how do you know, right? Um, and so long term, in terms of valence bond theory, etc., um, an orbital is going to take on whatever hybrid um, hybridization scheme it needs to lower potential energy. Um, but in terms of real actual molecules and real actual problems that you guys are going to deal with, the type of hybrid orbital used by a central atom is going to depend on the electron geometry of that central atom, right? So for example, in methane, carbon um, had four electron groups around it, right? So again, I should have maybe stayed on the previous slide to illustrate my methane. Um, let's get back to black. So for methane, we had four electron groups. And if we were talking about electron group geometry, then four electron groups yields tetrahedral electron group geometry, right? So what I'm telling you is that everything depends on the electron group geometry, not on the molecular geometry. So this is electron group geometry, right? So if you are tetrahedral in terms of electron group geometry, if you have four electron groups, you will utilize sp3 hybridization, right? So that does not just include methane, that is anything with four electron groups around it. So for example, ammonia is another good example. If we look at the Lewis structure for ammonia, ammonia, the nitrogen, again, is a central atom. It's the one that we're talking about. Um, this also has four electron groups, right? The four electron groups tells us that this derives from a tetrahedral electron group geometry. Three of them are bonding, one of them is non, right? And so that overall gives us a molecular geometry of trigonal pyramidal. But regardless, because this electron group geometry is tetrahedral, ammonia, the nitrogen, will also use sp3 hybrid orbitals. Right, and so what that looks like is in one of these sp3 hybrid orbitals, that's where that essentially lone pair goes, right? It's already paired up, so it's not ready to make a bond. Um, but then we have three other sp3 hybrid orbitals that are un have electrons that are unpaired that are ready to orbital overlap with the 1s orbitals from each hydrogen and pair their spin. And so from this, we get three sigma bonds between hydrogen and nitrogen, and then we have one of these sp3 hybrid orbitals that has our lone pair that lies um, solely on the nitrogen. So if I asked you what type of hybrid orbitals is nitrogen using in ammonia, you would say also sp3, because again, there are four electron groups and it has a tetrahedral electron group geometry. Same thing for oxygen in water. Right, water also has four electron groups, right? We get two from the two different lone pairs, two from the bonds. So we have four electron groups. It utilizes that tetrahedral electron group geometry. Again, its overall molecular geometry is bent because it has two bonding and two non, but the overall hybrid orbitals utilized is derived from this tetrahedral electron group geometry. So oxygen in water also uses sp3 hybrid orbitals. And now in this case, we have two of these orbitals that are already filled with um, what we would call the lone pair on oxygen. And then two of them have unpaired electrons that are ready to spin pair with the hydrogen. Okay. All right, so I had mentioned before um, that there are other types of hybridization um, depending on the molecule that we're looking at, right? So for example, let's utilize um, 
Um, let's utilize formaldehyde. Um, so for formaldehyde, the Lewis structure looks like this. Okay, again, in this molecule, we have three terminal atoms. So we have a hydrogen, an oxygen, and a hydrogen. And then we have our central atom right in the middle, which is our carbon, right? So when we talk about all these hybridization things, we're always talking about that central atom, okay? So now the question is, again, we still have carbon, and we've talked about carbon thus far overall. We're looking at the valence electrons of carbon. We know that the electron configuration is 2s2 and then 2p2. And if we went ahead and drew the orbital diagram, or the energy orbital diagram, for these valence electrons, again, these are valence, um, we have a 2s, and then we have our three 2ps, and we could go ahead and draw these guys in there. Now, again, with respect to what we're looking at, carbon, if nothing happened, if there was no hybridization whatsoever, could only form two bonds, right? So um, at this point in time, it has three bonds, or it has bonds with three other things, okay? Um, so without doing anything, that is not possible for formaldehyde, or the bonding scheme right now is not possible um, in terms of just the atomic orbitals, okay? Now, the question for me here is how many other things does does carbon bond with in this molecule, right? So we do have a double bond between carbon and oxygen, but in, in reality, carbon only bonds with three other things, right? So um, it has three other things bound to it, or another way to look at that is it has three electron groups, right? Again, there's a double bond, but a double bond counts as a single electron group, right? So because of that, it only needs three hybrid orbitals with which to form bonds with, right? So instead of taking all of the 2s, oops, so instead of taking all of the 2s and all of the 2p and making hybrid orbitals with it, what we're going to do instead is we're going to take an s and we're only going to take two of the p's, right? And we're going to go through the same process where we average those or we hybridize those. So we hybridize um, and so we draw our new hybrid orbitals. So again, if we're just taking one, two, three orbitals in, we're leaving one to just stay as its normal atomic orbital, then we're going to get three hybrid orbitals out, right? So we have one, two, three. We have a 2s, and now we're only taking 2p. So what these guys are going to be called is an s, or... I shouldn't say 2s, we're taking 1s and we're taking two of the p's. So these hybrid orbitals are going to be called sp2 because again, this number with respect to the p's is however many of these guys we're taking. So we have sp2 and then we also have left over um, this guy, right, which is just this atomic orbital, normal total p orbital that's going to be left unhybridized and it's going to have a little bit higher of an energy than the actual hybrid sp2 uh, hybrid orbitals, right? So again, we had one, two, three, four electrons to distribute. So now we're gonna put them in singly first. And this other one is actually gonna go into the p, the 2p orbital, the unhybridized atomic orbital. And so now um, we're ready to make bonds, right? And so what these guys would look like is if we're just taking in um, an s, and then two p's for these new hybrid orbitals, when we average them, we weight them, what we end up with is three new sp2 hybrid orbitals, right? And when we combine them, essentially what they look like is all of them lying in the exact same plane at um, 120 degrees apart from one another, right? So these new sp2 hybrid orbitals, they all lie in the same plane. So we'll say that's the plane of the paper, right? and they're all 122 or 120 degrees apart from one another. Now, we will also still have, and I wish I could draw, it's kind of hard here because like these guys all lie in, in the plane of the paper. We still have this 2p orbital. Um, and if we took in, we took in x and we took in y, so we'd still have this z left over. That's essentially gonna be like sticking up like above and below the plane of this paper that's unhybridized and looks like a normal uh, 2p orbital, okay?
Okay, now we're ready to make bonds with it, right? So we have our carbon, we have our new sp2 hybrid orbitals, right? We have one electron and one, we have one electron and one, we have one electron and one, okay? We're gonna bring in our hydrogen, right? So we had a hydrogen, one s, from the, uh, for one of our um, sp2 hybrid orbitals. We're gonna bring in another hydrogen, right, for the other one. Then we have an oxygen, we're gonna form a sigma bond with the atomic orbitals of oxygen that's gonna essentially orbital overlap in pair spins with that third sp2 hybrid orbital. So we have a hybrid orbital, hybrid orbital, hybrid orbital. But then with carbon, we still have this unpaired uh, 2p orbital, right? So we had a carbon here. We would have this, um, not unpaired, but hybrid, unhybridized 2p orbital, right? That has an electron in it. And if we looked at oxygen, oxygen, also has another um, orbital, right? And this is a, just an unhybridized atomic orbital. This is a 2p orbital that also has an unpaired electron um, in it with respect with which it can bond with, okay? So we form our normal sigma bonds between carbon with its new sp2 hybrid orbitals and hydrogen, right? Because these are sigma bonds along the internuclear axis, internuclear axis, this is again orbital overlap along the internuclear axis. But then we still have, if we go back to the energy diagram, a, a 2p orbital that is unhybridized on carbon. And if we looked at the atomic orbitals of oxygen, we also have a 2p orbital that's unhybridized for oxygen, right? Both of them have unpaired electrons. And again, the whole idea behind bonding in terms of valence bond theory is these unpaired electrons, if they can overlap, right, if they can get close to one another, then they're going to bond and that's going to um, essentially lower potential energy, right? But now, the big thing to note here is that these are not going to overlap in a way that we saw with respect for our sigma bonds here, right? Instead, when these guys come together, they're going to result in what we call a side-on. So a side-on orbital overlap as opposed to for sigma, for sigma we call that a head-on head-on orbital overlap, like two cars colliding head-on. Instead, these guys are going to be side-on, and so what we're going to get overall is the formation of orbital overlap here. And another thing to note is that these guys have to be in the same phase, right? So if we have a positive phase and a positive phase, this is what I mean by constructive interference, right? Um, again, if you go back to the wave above the plane, so we have a wave combining with a wave that is completely in phase with, then we get um, that constructive interference and we get a bigger wave. That's the exact same thing. So when I do the shading, I'm talking about the phase of the orbital, right? So this positive phase has to be in exact same phase with the orbital that's overlapping the side on manner. If we do that, we get what is called a bond, which is good, that's the entire purpose of this, but this is what we call a pi bond. Right, and it's going to form in this side-on manner as opposed as as opposed to the head-on manner that we have from the um, orbital overlap for the sigma bond. Right, so sigma bond is internuclear axis. These guys collide completely head-on in terms of these orbitals, um, and then these guys, these extra p before they bond bound, look like this. When they combine in the side-on, we get bond formation here. Right, as opposed to being in the head-on. Um, situation. And again, that's forming from these unhybridized p orbitals combining in phase. And again, they have to have unpaired electrons or we wouldn't get bond formation. But when they do combine and they do form this pi bond, then those orb those electrons overlap and we get a, a bond. Okay, so note um, this bond between carbon and oxygen here is the result of a head-on orbital overlap between a p orbital of oxygen and an sp2 hybrid orbital of carbon. It's also because of the side-on orbital overlap um, between an unhybridized p orbital and a p orbital from oxygen, right? Um, and so when we draw that in terms of the Lewis structure, we draw that as a double bond, right? So a double bond results in the formation of a sigma bond and a pi bond. Right, so double bonds are essentially one sigma, right, where we do get that head-on orbital overlap. It's also one pi, and I did say pi bond, yeah, and so again, pi is pi 
it's a Greek letter pi. Everyone's familiar with pi for the most part, so I'm happy with that. Um, but a double bond in terms of Lewis structure is actually a sigma and a pi. Whereas a single bond is again just a sigma. Okay, so there are some consequences with respect to this side on orbital overlap, right? So, um, first off, number one, the orbital overlap is what creates the bond, right? If the orbital doesn't overlap, if there is no in-phase constructive interference, then there is no bond, okay? Now, if you think in terms of a sigma bond, right, and you imagine these guys combining in this head-on manner, right, they're overlapping, they're overlapping. If you were to take this guy and you were to rotate it, right, let's say we rotated one side of this um, with respect to the inner nuclear axis, you would still get this overlap, right? That wouldn't change at all. And so because of that, um, for sigma bonds, sigma bonds are allowed free rotation because again, the bond is defined by that orbital overlap. If you freely rotate one or the other of these guys, like, um, how would I imagine this? Like you've skewered like a, an apple, right? And you just rotate that apple along the skewer. That's what I'm meaning by rotating this. Um, if you do that, you don't break the orbital overlap. The over, orbital overlap stays regardless if you rotate this uh, guy. I wanna make, it's like rotating it this way, you know? Now, if you did the same thing over here, right? So a pi bond again is um, coming about because of this side on orbital overlap. If you rotated this guy and just, let's just say this p orbital, right? If you rotated just one of them this way, then this side on orbital overlap, it breaks, right? You would break that orbital overlap. And because of that, um, you would, you'd break the bond, right? The pi bond overall. Um, and so because of that long term, um, when we talk about pi bonds or anything that have pi bonds, there is no free rotation about a pi bond because if you rotate it, you break it. No free rotation. And so long term, that means in terms of double bonds, there's no free rotation about double bonds because again, double bonds form from a sigma and a pi. A pi is in there. Another thing to note too, is that the better the orbitals are at overlapping, the stronger the overall bond, right? And so when you do get this sigma bond formation, this uh, head-on orbital overlap, those orbitals overlap really, really, really well. For pi bonds on the other hand, these guys don't overlap all that well. And so because of that, sigma bonds are stronger overall than pi bonds. And again, that's due to just better overlapping of atomic orbitals. Okay, so then um, we just finished up talking about sp2 hybridization. We had already talked about sp3 hybridization. And so we're going to talk about our final like grouping or clustering of hybridization, which is sp hybridization. And so we're going to utilize a molecule... Um, called acetylene to explain the hybrid orbitals that are formed to form the bonds in acetylene. So this guy has a carbon-carbon triple bond. Um, so note that this little bond here is a triple bond when we draw the Lewis structure. Um, and the first thing I'm going to ask, like long term, in trying to you know explain this hybridization, is again how many electron groups are around. Um, we're going to define this guy as our central carbon, right? So the question is how many electron groups. Again, we have uh, one electron group, and then we have a triple bond. We've already mentioned that any type of bond only counts as one electron group. So even though this is a triple bond, total, there are only two electron groups around this carbon, which is our central carbon. So two electron groups. If we think back in terms of electron group geometry, that tells us that this is uh, linear, right? And so... Another question that we can ask is, well, how many different things is carbon bound to, right? This carbon only needs to bind or make bonds with two other things, this carbon and this hydrogen. And so if we go back to the idea behind our um, electron or atomic orbitals and our electron configurations. We can draw 
the unhybridized orbitals for carbon. Again, we have our 2s and we have our 3, 2p. And now we can say, okay, well, if we only need a bond with two things, then for our hybridization scheme, what we're going to do is we're only going to take two of these orbitals. So we're going to take this guy and we're going to take one of these, right? So that's going to leave behind two unhybridized p orbitals. If we take in one, two, our new hybrid orbitals are going to be only two because we are only hybridizing two. They're again going to be an averaging of an s and one p. So we're going to call these sp hybrid orbitals. And then we're going to be left behind with two unhybridized 2p orbitals. And so if we took that, we can go ahead and distribute our electrons. We've got one, two, three, four. An sp hybrid orbital is an averaging of an s and a p. And again, we're getting two of them out. So when we combine these, again, we ignore the out of phase portion. We just combine um, the same phase portion, we're going to get something that looks like this, right? And again, this is all in the plane, same plane, right? So if you look at this, you'd be like, oh, this is linear, which is, oh, correlating with uh, acetylene being linear, right? So we have an electron in an sp orbital, we have an electron in an sp orbital. This guy, both of these are ready to form bonds. On this side, we're going to form a bond with the hydrogen, the 1s orbital. So we form a bond here. Again, this is a nice sigma bond. On this side, we're going to have that other carbon doing the exact same thing. So it's also going to have um, a hybridized sp orbital, right, that has an unpaired electron that's going to form a bond here. Again, we get another sigma bond. But then we're also going to have two of these unhybridized p orbitals that are also ready to bond. But again, they're not going to be able to bond in this head-on orbital overlap. Instead, they're going to be forced to bond in that head-on orbital overlap. And there are two of them. Right? So this is our carbon that we've defined. Again, we've already talked about this being the sp hybrid orbital, this guy being the sp hybrid orbital. Those guys have already formed their sigma bonds. Now we have one p, and then we have another p that's like pointing, kind of coming out of, it, out of us and going into the board. And both of those have an unpaired electron, and they're going to be matched exactly by the exact same thing on the other carbon, where we have an unhybridized P, an unhybridized P, ready to um, make a bond in this side on fashion, right? So when this guy and this guy come together, we're going to get the formation of a side on orbital overlap bond, which is a pi bond. And then when this guy and this guy come together, we're also going to get the same exact side on orbital overlap, which is another formation of a different pi bond. I maybe call the other one sigma. Again, side on is pi, head on is sigma. So we go back to the Lewis structure here. We had a sigma bond, a single bond, right? For the carbons, though, this triple bond, this ends up being the formation of a sigma down here. So we have one sigma. But then we also get two of these side on orbital laps over orbital overlaps, which is two pi bonds, right? So in terms of a triple bond, a triple bond is essentially the combination of a sigma and two pi. Okay, so that is a lot I know to take in. The question again could be, well, how do I know, right? How do I know what type? of hybrid orbitals an atom is using in a molecule. And I will say, once again, it all goes back to the electron group or the electron domain geometry, whatever word I'm using in this lecture, I can't quite remember, right? So you're gonna be given a nice, pretty table that looks something like this, right? Where it tells you, oh, how many electron groups are there in the molecule or whatever central atom you're looking at. If you're using this number, these are the hybrid orbitals that are being used. This is what they look like, right? And again, it's kind of where it's kind of where VSEPR comes from. It all comes back to these hybrid orbitals and the fact that in these sigma bond formations, those sigma bonds would form 180 degree um, apart from one another, and so that's what really determines the overall electron geometry. Same thing if we're using three, right? 
three electron group geometry is trigonal planar. Those are all 120 degrees with respect to one another. Those are sp2 hybrid orbitals to form that electron geometry. If we're using four, it's sp3. So note, we kind of explained this in reverse, right? So I've gone from four to three to two. Um, but what's happening as we go from two to three to four, right? All we're doing is we're adding in an extra p orbital to the types of orbitals that we're hybridizing. So we go from sp to sp2 to sp3, but again, there are only three p orbitals, right? So once we move past that, what is the next orbital that we could pull in to hybridize, right? We can't use another s, but instead what we're gonna utilize is we're gonna start to utilize the d orbitals, right? So for that trigonal bipyramidal electron group geometry, this is sp3d, and then for that octahedral electron group geometry, this is sp3d2. So everything hinges on the electron group geometry or the number of electron groups. If it's 2, it's sp. If it's 3, it's sp2. 4 is sp3. 5 is sp3d, and 6 is sp3d2. Now, you may say, do I have to memorize this? Well, I don't think it's that hard, because literally all you're doing is adding in a p orbital. Um, but no, you don't, because usually this will be given to you. And you can always consult back to this table in the handout, in the lecture notes. Okay, so let's go about doing some of these problems and how you're going to utilize this, the types of questions you're going to be asked. And then I think I have you do some more. I can't remember. Um, so this question is asking for these three molecules below, what type of hybrid orbitals? are the central atoms utilizing, okay? Now, I'm gonna walk you through how to go about answering this question, and then how to go about answering maybe some other questions that you could be asked as well, okay? So, first off, they just wanna know what hybrid orbitals are the central atoms utilizing in each of these three molecules. So I'm gonna start with number one. So if I go over here, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw the Lewis structure, all right? Because Lewis structure is gonna tell me everything with respect to electron groups, and then with hybrid orbitals, etc. Okay, so if I draw the Lewis structure, we have Br, F3, bromine is in the middle. Right now I'm gonna draw a crude Lewis structure that's not supposed to be depicting molecular geometry. Um, so we've got seven plus three times seven, so we have 28 overall. We've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. So I filled in all of my outer octets. I still have, I've only put in 24. I still have two more to get rid of. So now I'm gonna put these guys as a lone pair on bromine. So I have two different sets of lone pairs and I've been very distinct about drawing those as pairs of lone electrons. Okay, so with that, I can now predict for the central atom for bromine what the electron number of electron groups are all right so again i've got a bond i've got a bond i've got a bond so those are three electron groups then i have one lone pair i have two lone pair so overall total that is five electron groups so five electron groups now if i wanted to talk about the molecular geometry we do something different i don't care about that all i care about is electron groups here and so overall the electron group geometry is that trigonal bipyramidal, okay? Trigonal bipyramidal, five electron group geometry, right? Now, they're gonna ask me, okay, well, what type of hybrid orbitals does this trigonal bipyramidal five electron group geometry utilize? And I just know, well, if it's five, four was sp3, so five has to be sp3d. So it's using sp3d hybrid orbitals. And again, if you're like, I don't remember, you could go back to that table that was on the previous slide and look, oh, five electron groups, it's sp3d. Now, second, that's what the answer to this question is. It's five, it's sp3d. They asked about hybrid orbitals, that's the hybrid orbitals that it's utilizing. They could also ask about how many sigma bonds are present in the compound, or how many pi bonds are present in the compound, right? And so to do, to answer that, all you really have to do is look at the Lewis structure, right? 
The only bonds we have are single bonds, right? We know all single bonds are sigma bonds. There are three single bonds, so there are three sigma bonds. There are no double bonds or no triple bonds, so for pi bonds, there are none. It's zero. Okay, so then number two, we can talk about HSCN. So carbon is going to be a central atom here. We've got a hydrogen on one side, a nitrogen on the other. We've got a one plus a four plus a five, which gives us 10 electrons. So we have two, four. Hydrogen's done, we don't have to worry about him. So two, four, six, eight, ten. But now the problem with this is that uh, carbon doesn't have an octet. So to give it an octet, I'm going to take a, oops, that was a big eraser. I'm going to take a lone pair from my uh, terminal, from my nitrogen. I'm going to take one of these guys and I'll make a double bond. So now I have six around carbon. I'm also going to take another one. Oops, that's not an eraser. And make another one so now i have eight electrons around carbon i have eight electrons around nitrogen i have two around hydrogen everyone's good okay okay so this is lewis second thing we're going to do is we're going to say well how many electron groups do we have around our central atom so the answer to that is one two all right again it's a triple bond but it only counts as one electron group so overall, there are only two electron groups. So electron group geometry is linear. And we know from just two electron groups, the type of hybrid orbitals that carbon is using is sp hybridized. That's it. And again, that comes back from that chart. Now, another question again could be how many sigma and how many pi bonds are in the following structure? All right, so again, we have one single bond. We know that that is a sigma, but now we have a triple bond, right? And so we know that a triple bond forms from the head-on orbital overlap of these sp hybrid orbitals. So we have one sigma, right? But then those other two are from the side-on orbital overlap between those unhybridized p orbitals, right? So this is one sigma plus two pi. So overall in the structure, we have two sigma bonds and we have two pi bonds because a triple bond is one sigma and two pi. And then finally, S or COCl2. So we've got a C. This is going to be our central atom. We've got chlorine. We've got chlorine. We've got oxygen. So three. I'm getting all confused, COCl2. We've got a four plus a six plus a 14, it gives me 24. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. That's all the electrons I had. There's a problem though. Carbon doesn't have an octet. So I'm gonna take one of these guys. I'm gonna make a double bond. So the question could be, why didn't I take one from chlorine and make a double bond? And the answer to that is, uh, you, chlorine, all the halogens are never going to make more than one bond. So that's what I'll tell you. They're only ever going to make one bond. So just be happy with that. They're called monovalent. All right, so now we have our Lewis structure. Again, our central atom here is the one that's going to use these hybrid orbitals to bond. So we're talking about carbon. In this structure, carbon has three electron groups around it, right? So we have one bond, two bond, and then we have a double bond, but that still only counts as one electron group. The electron group geometry is trigonal, planar. All of those bonds are 120 degrees with respect to one another. It's not drawn that way in my Lewis structure, but that's what they are. And then we know that three electron groups in terms of hybrid orbitals is sp2 hybrid orbitals. So that is the answer to this question. And again, the sp2 leaves that one unhybridized orbital to essentially make that double bond between carbon and oxygen. Make that bond 
with respect to that side on orbital overlap. You need that thing to be sticking up above and below the plane of the, the hybridized orbitals so that you can get that side on orbital overlap. And so then the question would be, well, sigma and pi, here we've got a sigma, we've got a sigma. So both of these guys are sigma bonds, they're single bonds. But then for the double bond, we know that a double bond is one sigma and then one pi. So overall, we've got one, two, three sigma, and then we've got one pi. Okay, well, hopefully that makes sense. Okay, and so um, I'm not going to promise that the structure is going to be that simple all the time. So for example, I could draw out a bunch of things. And let's say we've got a carbon and an oxygen and a carbon. And I could say, okay, here's a structure. I want to know what type of hybrid orbitals, let's say uh, carbon one is using. I wanna know what type of geometry it has. I wanna know how many total sigma and pi bonds are in the structure. The basics behind it are the exact same. So again, if I had said how many sigma and how many pi bonds are in this overall structure, you would do the exact same thing, right? For every single bond, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, every single bond is a sigma bond, right? We have one double bond, and we know that that double bond is just a sigma and then one pi. So we had nine single bonds, and then one of this would have been another sigma bond. Then we would have ten sigma bonds, and then the other part of this guy would have been a pi. Then we have one pi, right? For the, let's say, molecular geometry, the hybrid orbitals, it's the exact same thing. I look at carbon, I say, how many things is it attached to? Or how many electron groups does it have around it? It has four of them, right? Four electron groups tells me it's tetrahedral, which tells me it's sp3 hybridized. Same thing for the oxygen, same thing for everything else. Any of these guys can be counted as central, right? As long as they don't terminate the molecule. Um, so don't get confused if it starts to expand on the molecules. The, the process is the exact same regardless. Okay, and so with that, I'm going to move into talking about molecular orbital theory, um, which is going to come next. It's unfortunate. This is what we have to end on. Okay, deep breath. Okay, all right. So I'm going to keep it real simple, real short with respect to molecular orbital theory. This is the most complex of our bonding theories, right? So we go from Lewis to valence bond to molecular orbital, but it's also going to explain things exceptionally well, okay? So it's difficult to access, it's difficult to understand, but it explains bonding and molecules almost perfectly, okay? Okay, so what is the big idea behind molecular orbital theory? Okay, so we're gonna just draw out right now, we're gonna start with a little molecule of hydrogen. It always starts with hydrogen, our little H2, okay? Okay, so in valence bond theory, we try to explain bonding in terms of atomic orbitals and atomic orbital overlap, okay? The difference between molecular orbital theory and valence bond theory is that in molecular orbital theory, we say, well, it's not really just a combination of atomic orbitals. What it is, is it's essentially a molecule, right? And what forms these bonds are what are going to be called molecular orbitals. So the idea behind it is that it takes molecules, right? And it tries to solve the Schrodinger equation for the molecules itself, right? Just like we solved the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, right? What we got out of the hydrogen atom was our atomic orbitals, our S, our P, our D, okay? That's what molecular orbital theory is trying to do. It's trying to take the entire molecule and solve the Schrodinger equation for it and get out the overall orbitals that are gonna form the basis behind all of these bonds, okay? The problem with that is, ideally, if you were looking at it, besides hydrogen, could we ever discreetly solve the Schrodinger equation for any other type of atom? No, right? So if we can't do it for anything besides hydrogen, do you think we're gonna be able to do it for an actual molecule, we have multiple nuclei and you have multiple electrons going into it? No, right? 
So what molecular orbital theory sticks with or deals upon or hinges on is making approximate solutions to these overall molecular orbitals, okay? So again, these molecular orbitals are going to be solutions. They're going to be approximate solutions to the Schrodinger equation, solving it for the entire molecule, okay? Now, unfortunately, these approximations are very mathematically complex, and they're not really something that we can necessarily do by just looking at things, right? So we try to keep molecular orbital theory kind of simple and how we actually utilize it to just give you an overall idea about what actually happens in the theory itself, okay? Okay, so now we're going to follow the same exact rules that we have followed for all of our various atomic orbitals when we're dealing with these molecular orbitals. So what are we going to actually look at or try to deal with when we're actually dealing with these molecular orbital theory, okay? So again, we're going to start with a very simple molecule, H2, which I've already drawn, okay? If we take the valence electrons, again, of hydrogen, we know what both of those valence electrons, the orbitals that they reside in, look like, right? So for each hydrogen, we had our valence electrons in the 1s, we had our valence electrons in the 1s, okay? Now, what do those guys look like again, the 1s orbitals? They're nice and spherically symmetric, okay? So now, what molecular orbital theory deals with, or how we try to get these orbitals out of molecular orbital theory, is via a method called linear combination of atomic orbitals, okay? What we're going to look at is the various ways that we can combine these two molecular orbitals, or these two atomic orbitals, to produce molecular orbitals, okay? So one way that we can combine these two guys, if we go back to this idea behind these orbitals being waves, is we can combine them via constructive interference, okay? So just as a reminder, if we have waves, there's always a phase to waves, right? So these orbitals are just waves themselves. We have a plus phase and we have a minus phase. If I take a wave that has this phase and I combine it with another wave that is completely in phase with, what do I get overall? What is that called? If I combine this guy, do I cancel the waves or do I, I make a big wave, right? So this is what we call constructive interference, okay? So we would get some big gigantic wave that resulted. These orbitals are just waves, right? They're waves, we don't really look at them like waves, but they are just waves. They also have phase to them, okay? So one way that we could take these two 1s orbitals and combine them is constructively, right? They could be completely in phase. So we could take our 1s and our 1s from our two hydrogen. If we combine them constructively, what we're going to be left with is essentially a big gigantic weight or a big gigantic orbital where they have combined constructively, okay? So again, these guys are both in phase at this point in time. The constructive interference of these two is going to produce what we call a bonding orbital, okay? So this constructive interference is going to be called a bonding orbital. Now, there is another way that we could take these two atomic orbitals and combine them. We could combine them in a destructive manner, right? So one of the waves or one of the orbitals could be completely out of phase. We'll denote that via some sort of little color. So completely out of phase with the other one, right? So if I take two waves and I combine them and they're out of phase, what am I going to get? Just like if I was over here and I had a wave and we added it to something that it was completely out of phase with, what would I get? Zero, right? So we would get the destruction of that wave, right? So when we take these guys and we take them as they are out of phase with one another and we combine them, what are we going to get when we combine them? If we think in terms of probabilities and all of these orbitals, what is zero probability with respect to our orbitals? What do we call that? A no, right? So when we take these guys and we combine them and they essentially cancel one another when they combine, what we're going to get is the development of what is called a node. So to draw that, we would take these guys and we would get this guy and we would get this guy and right in the middle, there is zero probability of finding an electron, okay? So this is what we call our anti-bonding molecular orbital. So anti-bonding molecular orbital. 
This is our bonding molecular orbital. So bonding molecular orbitals develop when we have constructive interference. We've combined things in phase. Anti-bonding molecular orbitals happen when we combine things destructively, and they produce a node when we do that. They essentially go to zero where we actually overlap them. Okay? Who do you think is going to be energetically more stable? Things that are combined constructively to get this big old probability or things that have combined and introduced a node in the process. So nodes. Nodes are inherently bad with respect to energetics, right? Anytime we introduce a node into something, it's going to destabilize it and it's going to raise its energy comparatively, okay? So what we get out of this, we get two probabilities because we took two atomic orbitals. What we're going to get is two molecular orbitals. We're going to get our bonding molecular orbital that's going to be at a lower energy state than our anti-bonding molecular orbital. Okay. And we can depict that in a nice little atomic orbital diagram. So now if we look at our two orbital overlaps, we have our bonding molecular orbital and our anti-bonding molecular orbital. What does this bonding molecular orbital look like with respect to the types of bonds that we've been dealing with already? So right now, when we get this orbital overlap, is this in a head-on manner? So what type of bond does this look like? A sigma bond, right? So because of that, what we call this particularly, this bonding molecular orbital, is a sigma MO, or a sigma molecular orbital, okay? And this anti-bonding molecular orbital, it's like this anti-bond of our sigma, so we call that a sigma star molecular orbital, okay? And it's going to, again, be at a little bit higher of an energy than our sigma molecular orbital. Okay, so now let's combine this to explain bonding in hydrogen, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to draw what is called a molecular orbital diagram. And in the molecular orbital diagram, there are going to be the contributions of our atomic orbitals. So this is from our two hydrogens. So we have atomic orbital, atomic orbital. And in between them, we're going to put our newly formed molecular orbitals, right? So for those, we had a sigma, right, a bonding molecular orbital. So we call this sigma 1s, and it's at a little bit lower energy comparatively. And then we also had the creation of an anti-bonding molecular orbital. We call this sigma star. That's a sigma, my bad. So this is sigma star, okay? Now, if these are our atomic orbitals, and these are our molecular orbitals, we are now going to take the electrons that are in our atomic orbitals, and we're going to put them in our molecular orbitals, right? So how many electrons are in each of these hydrogen 1s atomic orbitals? One, right? So each guy, each hydrogen brings a one, right? So if we're going to now take those electrons and we're going to distribute them into our molecular orbitals, where are they going to go if we're following the off-bot principle where we're building from lowest energy up? They're going to both go, and they're going to pair spins into our sigma bonding molecular orbital, okay? Okay, so now we can calculate what is called the bond order of this molecule. So to do that, all we need is the number of bonding molecular, or number of bonding electrons, and we're going to subtract from that the number of anti-bonding electrons, and then we're going to divide all of that by two. So for this bond order, for molecular hydrogen, what do we get? How many bonding electrons do we have? So how many electrons do we have in our bonding molecular orbital, our sigma 1s? We have two electrons. How many electrons do we have in our anti-bonding sigma star molecular orbital? Zero. So we have two minus zero all over two. What is the bond order for molecular hydrogen? One, right? What is the bond when we draw our nice little Lewis structure for molecular hydrogen? It's a single bond, right? That results in our bond order of one. So these guys both agree with each other fairly well, okay? As a note, anything that has a positive bond order is going to be stable and it's going to form, okay? So this is a positive one. This molecule does form. The larger the bond order, the stronger the bond. And that anything that has a zero or a negative bond order will not form. 
So ideally, you guys could utilize that to show that helium, diatomic helium, will not form because it has a bond order of zero. Okay, so I'm going to leave that. Okay, so I tried to leave that as that, but I want to go ahead and actually demonstrate this. Um, so again, I don't, we've, we've seen before with respect to chemistry, we see molecular hydrogen, we see molecular oxygen, etc. We've never really seen molecular helium, right? And so the idea behind this is, hey, why don't we see helium make a diatomic element? Why don't we actually see a bond form between them, okay? So now, if we think of helium in terms of what we've been thinking about in terms of molecular orbital theory, um, if we think of energies, right, and we think of each helium atom that we would be bringing in to make this diatomic helium, and we think of the um, atomic orbitals that each helium would be bringing in, if we looked at the periodic table, Helium has, each helium has an electron configuration of 1s2, right? So again, it'd be the exact same thing. We're bringing in an s orbital from one, we're bringing in an s orbital from another. They're going to constructively interfere and form our, our sigma bonding molecular orbital, which is going to be at a lower energy than the atomic, electro, um, than the atomic orbitals. And then they're going to destructively interfere and form our sigma star antibonding molecular orbital, okay? Now, the big difference here comes in this guy. Each helium atom has in its 1s atomic orbital, it has two electrons already, right? So this is our 1s atomic orbital. The other one also has two electrons. They are spin paired, okay? Now, as we put them into our new molecular orbitals, we have four total electrons to get rid of. We are again gonna put them in via off ball. So we're gonna put them into the lowest energy orbital first, but then we still have two more to get rid of, right? And so the next two, are going to go into our sigma star, our anti-bonding molecular orbital. So now, if we wanted to calculate the bond order for helium, again, bond order is number of bonding electrons minus the number of anti-bonding electrons divided by 2. Right. So now, in this molecule, we have two electrons that are bonding. But we also have two electrons up here that are non-bonding, right? So 2 minus 2 divided by 2 is equal to 0. And I mentioned before, if we have a bond order of 0 or negative, that is energetically unfavorable, that is energetically unstable. Unstable, look at me trying to combine words. Um, and so that bond will not form. It is not favorable for those atoms to make that bond energetically, and so they will stay apart as their own little individual self, which is what we find for helium. We don't get diatomic helium, we just get helium by itself. Energetically, it's better for this guy to just stay as helium. Okay, so if you read through the chapter, there's actually some interesting stuff that goes on in terms of molecular orbitals um, as we move on to larger molecules. Not larger molecules, but for our kind of intents and purposes, we kind of just stick with, hey, how do we combine 1s orbitals to form our new molecular orbitals? But if we got up into something like oxygen, diatomic oxygen, or diatomic nitrogen, we would also have to learn how to combine the 2p orbitals, um, those atomic orbitals to form new molecular orbitals. I don't go into that, but you should read that because it's kind of interesting and it helps explain a couple of the experimental properties um, between like, let's say oxygen versus nitrogen, diatomic nitrogen, um, and why maybe one of them is actually attracted to magnets while the other is not attracted to magnets. Um, so, you know, you could read through the rest of the chapter, but we're gonna essentially finish talking about molecular orbital theory here and calculating bond order for very simple molecules, okay? Okay, all right, so I think that's it. Um, and good luck with whatever homework you have to finish at this point.